in, we are a very young country. Our nation is very young. Compared to England and other countries, we are so young. We have so much to learn yet still about each other, about the life we live, the land we live on, our surroundings. And so, there's our guest. Oh, no yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Come on in, guys. I'm just getting started. Okay. Would you like to introduce yourselves? We, we all introduced ourselves. Don't take it personally, but Patty's here. <laughs> I'm Patty Godfroy from YMCA. I'm Dean Gogoleski from YMCA. Great. Hello. Welcome. So, thank you. Uh, Wabash was founded in and around 1834. Uh, we our county seat was going to be LeGrow, and so they really focused on LeGrow for the first couple of years, hoping that that was going to be the major attraction for Wabash County. With the canal coming through, we learned very quickly that that was a huge mistake. <laughs> Even though the canal is really cool to talk about, um, it was eight years of financial burden that they did not plan on. So because I always say, you want to build something through a canal path or you want you know something and all all year round you have to be careful because you have to listen to nature and nature never lies oh. the, the the canal only was functioning so many months out of the year okay mm -hmm. so you have to be careful when you're going treading through those areas especially back then you have to remember we had dense forest there were really no roads through Wabash and so, you know, I, it was just, that was the only way of transportation besides horse and buggy. And the unfortunateness of it was that Wabash County was a lot of plank road. So if you can imagine planks going this way and your wheels going over it, things got wore out pretty fast. It was hard on the person traveling, you know, so things like that. It was just um, not an easy life. Everybody wants to go back in time because they think it was so much easier. Not really. <laughs> no, no, not really. We have it pretty easy now, so. Uh, so fast forward, we're into Wabash, and they decide to start focusing on the city downtown. Um, the only remaining buildings that are existing still from the Canal Day is on um, Canal Street, where the Plain Dealer building is, right on the corner. It's those first, those those three buildings back before it. So if you want to see what Canal Era buildings still look like today, it's those first three buildings or right beside the Plain Dealer building on Canal Street. So um, they, they were saved in the fire. We had the Great Fire of 1870, and over 73 buildings burned down to the ground. So those three actually were saved. And so I always tell people that are renting those buildings, I'm like, yeah, a really cool building. And they're like, really? Yeah, it's was like it the cool? oldest buildings in town. What was the cause, a gender reveal? <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> Probably, you know, what was the cause? I think it was a lantern turnover or something. You know, we didn't have a fire system back then. And so you're hauling bucket, the bucket bucket for days coming up, trying to forget it. Actually, they got the fire out, and it burnt the courthouse down, the original courthouse. And they thought they had it out, and it reignited, and that's when it took out the rest of the buildings. And you said how many buildings were? It's about 73 that we know of. Uh-huh. So um, we have three courthouses. The one you see is the one that was electrically lit in 1880, 1879, okay? And that was a really exciting time for Wabash. Uh, there was fear, there was excitement. Um, the courthouse was really kind of a, an experiment. Nobody really knew if this was gonna work or not, so Wabash said, yeah, we'll take it on. So they brought the brush dynamo machine in. It was generated by candle arc light. And so they hoisted it up there and uh, it went, you know. It didn't last very long though. After a couple of years of just the candle arc lighting, they moved on to another system. So the system that you see is like the fifth system on the top of the courthouse now. The actual dynamo arc light is still on display inside the courthouse. So if you ever want to see what they look like, it's really cool. So. Do you have a question? No. Oh, I thought you'd raise your hand. It's like a, it's like an auction. Don't raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> but I think for Wabash and for all of you that are, most of these people are from out of city. So they're not even from, they're from Indiana Revived. So they've come from other places to learn about Wabash County and our history here. And so that's, for me, we are the first lit city. Everyone in the world looked at Wabash 
that's what I want to see in the revival of Indiana. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everyone looking to Wabash in the world. Something's happening here today, right now, as we're gathering to spark that fire and that light to go out. So that's part of why we wanted to do right. what we were doing. Is we were the first lit, and we want to light that light for God and the spiritual revival to start from here to go out to revive Indiana, to go out into the nation, to go out into our world, because that is the Great Commission, and that's what God called us to do. I agree, and I, I think Wabash is a, a city of firsts. We're the yes. first one. That's the most important one. We beat out Paris. We were so quick on it. Paris was quick on our tail, and we won in that, that race. That awesome. So that it was awesome. really fascinating. And when um, was that? That was 1879, 1880, March 31st, 1880. So they're building the courthouse in 78, and then um, 79, it's getting ready to be completed, and then they take on this experiment by 1880. The fear was that the lights would stay on, and so they thought the corn would keep growing oh. in the fields because of the light. So they thought the, the corn's going to get 25 feet high. Um, oh my gosh, the, the cows are never going to sleep. Um, oh my gosh, what, what are we going to do? And the biggest problem they actually had was um, when it lit the city. You could see it for miles. People were afraid of it. But it also lit the wrong sides of the street downtown. So you would only walk on the south side of the streets because the north side of the streets were dark. And so at night, now the businesses are staying open later because there's light and they can see, so their, their businesses are booming only on the south side of the streets. So they had to quickly come up with a lighting system of lamps for downtown. You know, they were all candlelit or gas burning later. So we, we came very quickly, you know, very quickly. In that whole ordeal, we can't forget about our First Nations, okay? So our Indians are starting to get pushed. They're getting pushed out of the county a little bit further, you know. As the metropolis is coming up, the Indians are going back to no reservations. We had 18 reservations on Wabash County, all bordering the river. Okay, and so um, what we were really trying to do was hope that they would come in and want to grasp this new way, this way of thinking, this progress. And some of them did. You know, it was really good. I, I'm always team Indian. So they were good guys. So yeah, well. So, um, you know, but they were very influential in their own ways. And so people would still go to them for tradition and to feel kind of like, well, we're kind of losing. Progress is really happening so fast for us. We want to go back and, and talk to these guys and, you know, make sure that they're feeling included. And so we, we, we did to the best of our ability. But the treaties were happening early in the 1820s. Um, that was a mess. I mean, basically, they got robbed. <laughs> They got robbed really bad. They, they fed them, they liquored them, they promised promises they did not ever intend to keep, and here we are, you know. There's a little bit of acreage left over in Miami County, and um, I got my toe in the door, just this toe right here, and I don't want to lose it. So I tread lightly with them, I respect them. Um, I, as a society from 1812, we try to help them as much as we can. You know, they need something, we've built monuments for them couple things, you know, so um, we're hoping to incorporate them to the reenactment this next year. There's a little interest, so I'm hoping we merge, you know, so we can't forget our First Nations and the people who were here first, and, many, um, yeah. How many families or Native American families are still here in Wabash, you know? Oh, any numbers? thousands. Thousands. Thousands, right, Patty? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're all, we're all related. So a friend of mine, he's fifth generation of Francis Slocum. My understanding is that at that five, it kind of ends right there. If there were annuity payments to still be made, if he would have had a child, the sixth generation would kind of be weeded out. The government actually put dates on it. It's like my husband is fourth direct from Chief Francis Godfrey. Right. And so um, they put dates on how, what percentage of Indian you are, okay. actually. And so it's not really your blood with the DNA test. It's what the government considers you by your birth date, first so, year. And at five, mm -hmm. 
At six, mm -hmm. not so much. I think it's done at yeah. six generations. So, but I would say there's there's thousands represented still of the original First Nation and the and the the original land holders um, for Wabash. I mean, you still hear the Miamis say, "I'm uh, from the Bundy clan. I'm from the Godfrey clan. I'm from this clan." You know, so um, they know the roots. They do, <laughs> and I'll never challenge it. You know, I I support it. I don't know enough of it. Yeah, so. I know where to go and not go when I'm out scouting, you know, so. I work blessed enough, we actually own part of the Reservation 13, so our property goes all the way to the Wabash River, and so as we were doing the research on our land, then we found out that ours was Reservation 13. So that was another thing that kind of spooked our interest in, in preserving the Wabash River, and um, we have been fighting the bike trail it's not because we don't like bikes, we want to preserve the waterways, we want to preserve the history, and some places the bike trail shouldn't go. And so that was part of the, of the researching and figuring that out and preserving the history for the next generation. So it, it, it's a tough battle to be because you want to honor and respect the past, you want to move forward, but like she was saying with the canal, you have to realize that if you build in the flood zone, what happens in the flood zone? It floods. So know your cost or you're constantly going back and repairing it. So then it makes it cost prohibitive, but if you haven't figured out the cost in the long run, you don't know what the short term is. Yeah. And in a million dollars a mile, you don't want to have to keep repairing it. So it's like, it's not rocket science. It's why the canal didn't work. The canal didn't work because of vandalism, because it was seasonal, and because of cars. Well, people aren't going to give up their cars. People, the you know, vandalism is still going to happen out there, and the weather is still a part that happens in Indiana every year, and several times a year. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. yeah, I mean, those, they're still there. Well, and I think with all the history, there's there's a there's always a light side to the Wabash, and there's a dark side to the Wabash, and there's a lot of things in our community that we sh really should not celebrate. We talk about it. Uh, there's a lot of things that. Um, happen that we don't really quite know everything about. We'd love to. And some of it's really none of our business. Yeah. You know, some things have happened, it's like, okay, let it go, you know. So, um, like I said, we're a city of firsts. We have a lot of things that are about that we can brag about. Um, just really proud. I know, I hope I'm here in 2032, because there is a uh, time capsule buried in the Wabash City Park. And I would really like to be one of those people that gets to unearth it. Yeah. So it'll be 100 years old. We know where it's at. Wow. So that's something I'd really like to be a part of. And there's there's time capsules all over Wabash, actually. There's one in the courthouse. Uh, there's one in City Park. There's one I can't tell you about. <laughs> I might on my deathbed, maybe. Yes. I need to write a book on yes. that one. So. But, on. uh, um, are there any questions? Let's get started with some questions. That way I don't bore you to death. I can I can just start telling you things. Hopefully I know them. Mm -hmm. Anything that interests you. It can be gory. It can be scary. It can be happy. Any one subject you've heard about that you want to know? Yes? So, um, you say city of first. Uh -huh. Where are they first? Uh, we've had a, a race car driver uh -huh. uh, that won the Indy 500. Um, you're going to put me on the spot, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, right. we, we have... Um, I just always heard it first. Yeah. You know, and yeah. the one I knew of was electric, so I just... Does anybody else know what first we had? Yeah. Let me think on it, because okay. there, there are several. I, just, I don't know what you're interested in, you know, so... Oh, I was just wondering... Yeah. First we've had country music singers, we've had famous authors, we've had famous... You name it, we've had a lot of famous people propel us to be the first of our kind or the first to do that. Uh, yes. Well, Gail, Gail sure. Jean Stratton oh, I know her. Yes, you yes. knew that one. Yes. You're talking about the uh, Jimmy Daywalt guy? Yes. Yep. He says he didn't win the final, he drove in it. He drove in it, yes, sorry. Right. <laughs> but he's, he, we do claim him. You know, it's like our claim to fame. It's like, he won in our minds. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's a winner, Amos. <laughs> and I think they, I do think that they uh, put a plaque downtown by the museum in his honor just like shortly a year ago, I think. Okay. Which was really great. So I'm not sure what the building's called, but like there's an inner hotel. 
that somebody told me it was the first concrete foundation. Is that true? Or something with the foundation? Hmm. The inner hotel? I think it's uh, it's a hotel now. It's like it, it looked pretty fancy, yeah. but I didn't. Go oh, there. the Charlie Creek. But uh, they said it was as the first building in in Wabash, or like, I don't know if it's Indiana or like that, the concrete foundation. Is that huh. that could be very true because we're on on limestone. So most of the buildings downtown that were pre 30s, 20s are all still sitting on a limestone limestone foundation. I think that's why we have a lot of paranormal activity in Wabash. We sit on a bed of limestone. That is what I want to ask. Yes. <laughs> we, we know that limestone is a conductor of energy. Okay, and so limestone is going to bring to you a lot of energy. And it absorbs. So limestone, limestone will absorb that energy and it will hold on to it. That's just what they say. That's why I think a lot of people downtown, a lot of the older homes that are on limestones tend to have activity or sightings, residuals. Things that are have a memory is what will keep bringing itself up. So, uh, but yes, as far as the concrete, now that was a swamp. Before that hotel was built, it was a swamp. And then later they filled it in and made it a baseball field. And then it had a flowing well, which is capped off under the hotel. Um, and then they built the hotel. So 1920 is when the Red Apple Inn was built. Now it's the Charlie Creek Inn. Yep. Do you have any more? Um and then I read that, is it the Methodist Church that has the papers in the foundation cornerstone? The papers for? Uh, under, they had 100 pages of history that they put into the oh, probably. And then they, hmm. they capped it with, it so it's the Methodist Church and whatever they... That wouldn't they surprise me. A lot of okay. our, a lot of the churches probably did that, um, depending on if it's year 100, 150. Uh, 75, if they did a cornerstone of any kind, yeah, that wouldn't surprise me at all. I just read that and found yeah. it very interesting that they put history pages inside of the right. The stone. It's like that's never going, you're not going to be able to get that. No, no. Well, and we they found a time capsule at the Wabash High School several years ago when they finally opened it. It was a copper box, there were a uh, hundred year old seeds, um, hundred year old currency shards of paper it was very odd you know it's just everything that they could think of they crammed into this time capsule and we got to see it you know and there was over 200 items in the time capsule which was amazing so um i think it just it depends on what's dear to you and what you want to represent at the time capsule was found maybe they thought Oh, they're probably going to genetically modify all of our stuff. Right, yeah. yeah. We want to go in there so they can have real food. We're not going to start. Yes. We'll go to that crusty time capsule and make some corn or something. Yeah. Possible and it's not bad. <laughs> so what's the, I heard that because of being lighted downtown, uh -huh. that was, that led to a uh, maybe not so good Nightlife being right. in town, is that accurate? Yeah, the, um, so the uh, railroad yards yeah. where Paradise Spring is now, if you wanted to get mugged or jumped, just go on down. <laughs> you know, women should not have been down there at night. They never encouraged women to go stand alone. Um, if you had money on you, gold watches, anything of value, you better hang on to it because that is where it most likely was going to happen. The Rip Raff always hung out down there. The railroad houses were all down there with railroad road workers rented rooms for the evening. Um, so by the time the canal is out, which is still there, it's just empty sometimes. Uh, it became a waste collector, really. It was uh, the railroad is in. It's dark. It's bad. Yeah, nothing good is coming out of there after nine o'clock at night. So the cities, as I said, it was dark on one side. People literally would not walk on this dark side of the street, even though this side was lit, and it may only be 8 o'clock at night. They were scared to death, you know. And going down the, the covered bridge, so the Wabash River, where the bridge is now, that was the longest covered bridge in Indiana that went at an angle instead of like this. Uh, you just didn't go in there at night. You didn't take your horses over there. Uh, the thugs would wait in the bridge and jump you at nighttime there. So, yeah, I mean, we had our fair share of crime. A lot about, like, of crime. nightlife, like, in town, like, yeah. different uh, bars, different Yeah, we uh, had uh, 
probably 60 cabins. That's it? That's it. <laughs> in, in, a, in a two to three street capacity, about 60 cabins. Now, but you have to realize, a tavern back then was a meeting area. It was a congregational room. It wasn't necessarily always for drinking, but you can guarantee someone was always drinking. But that was an office for some people. Businessmen, they would, if they were politicians, they would take them down to the river, get them a bucket of fresh mussels to eat, and then bring them up to the tavern for a drink, and they got their vote. You know, that's just the way it was. But 60, yeah, 60 taverns on average were in Wabash. Um, we had um, cat houses. We had several. Uh, downtown, because of the railroad, the canal, that was just very common. Very common. So it was, it was business. So that's just what they did. And yeah, I mean, crime didn't go unpunished in Wabash at all. You, you could literally deplete someone of their life and you would be instantly, if you didn't get the worst, the same punishment as you gave that person. You know, you, you just, a lot of crime happened in Wabash. A lot of seedy crime. A lot of crime that never went, uh, well, the gambling. The gambling was okay. I mean, it wasn't as, it was okay. It wasn't as bad as what we think. I mean, the worst gambling we had was out here on um, Old 24 where the McClure home used to stand where um, Alloys is. That's the oldest brick structure in Orange County. The grandmother was the ringleader. <laughs> I mean, she, that was the crookedest family in Wabash County at the time. The McClure's. They wrote a, a book on it called The Wild Donahue's. It's a great read. Wild, Wild Donahue's. Uh huh. Uh, Grandma ran a gambling house on the top floor, and the, the track outside had horses. They would steal your horse if you came to stay and lay over, get you in a gambling, a little bit of poker, liquor you up, steal your horse, trade you for a fat one with broke back, you know. So, I mean, that was just the way they did it. They had an Indian trading post out there. Um, and robbed the Indians so blind. Uh, and then a gentleman was killed on the top floor over a gambling game, and you know, it just became, my uncle and aunt actually lived there in the 60s for a very short amount of time. Um, and then it's just been pillaged. The, the interior is in different buildings here in town. They've been, you know. So are you saying that the, the crime rate went up because of electricity, or how was it before like it was lit? Honestly, I think crime was, really bad between 1830s and the 1890s. The French family murders happened in 1854, 55. Um, the the uh, canal workers, the Irish riot broke out. That was bloody, no good. The, the Indian wars were going on, treaty or not, nobody was getting along. Uh, women were getting killed and getting away with it. You know, uh, just just a lot of tough stuff. So you what, know, what changed in the '90s that? Because you kind of sounds like 2020 right now. We're just kind of figuring out. What yeah, changed. right. How can we change? Um, what happened? The the industrial revolution. I think people became a little more dignified. They wanted it. They wanted to be more proper. They wanted to dress better. They wanted people to come be in their city. So they knew they had to clean it up. Sanitation finally got cleaned up, the streets were getting cleaned up, the water tasted good finally, the trash was out of town, finally. And so by 1890s, you're getting eloquent homes being built, you know, 10 room homes with 12 fireplaces. The money was here, the money was here. So like, by creating jobs, you gave some of these people, instead of doing stupid stuff, here, come do something and you'll get paid for it. And Absolutely, I mean, we, we built airplanes, we built service trucks, we, we had muscle down at the river, we were harvesting oysters and making buttons. I mean, it just, the list goes on and on. We had so much going on. And then on top of buildings being built, houses being built, bridges being built, roads being better. I mean, you could get a job and do anything at any time in Wabash County. There was no excuse at all. So. You could hop the railroad and go, get a, get a job, you know, yeah. And I think that's what changed. I think just people wanting to live a better life. And really, if you think about it, when you look around Wabash, it's still kind of the same. The mentality is, is still there. 
I will tell you that people in Miami County, you guys are, or Wabash County, they, they, you're cultured. You're, it is different, isn't it? it I, I agree. We, for some reason, it around us, it doesn't seem to want to be so proper. No. Wabash County has set a precedence a long time ago, and it has not changed since. Yeah. It's yeah. very proper. It is. It is. We like the culture. We like arts. We like dining. We like entertainment. And I think that that mentality has not changed in well over 150 years. Did you have a question? I do have a totally different. That's fine. Right. Yeah, let's jump. That's fine. I would be interested to hear more about the First Nations and were there um, battles fought? I mean, I don't know. Was it was it all settled by the time the city or the county was founded in 1834, or was there conflict? How, how did that work out? So. When the Revolution War broke out in 1776, after that happened, they brought scouts up here into Indiana. They wanted to know what was going on in Indiana. So under George Washington's orders, scouts came through. They documented what they seen here. They documented the rivers. They documented um, uh, hanging, 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 rock. hanging rock. Thank you. I mean, what is beautiful, it's called hand tracks reports. Back then, in around 1770s, you could read what people saw in Wabash County well before we were ever a county or even thought of. Yeah. And so they describe, you know, the roads and the scenery and, and the hills, and it's really amazing. So then 1812 breaks out. We have a battle right here in our own backyard. Um, it affected the Indians greatly because it was a mistake. They shouldn't have ever ever attack those villages. It was the wrong villages. And they were unattended by the bucks. The women and children were left. There was a few of the older men still there, but they attacked them wrongly. It was such a humiliation to the President of the United States and all the generals involved. It was awful. But nonetheless, it happened. And uh, several people were killed. We commemorate it. By 1820s, we're doing a peace treaty. It's down at uh, the Paradise Spring. All the nations were represented. The chiefs were there. They came to the agreement. After that, I think the mentality was um, they just never were as good as the whites. Okay, so of course they're going to be treated bad. The ones that lived with them on the reservations around Waltz Township, or where Sheila's farms are, where the Indians rested and where they settled, if, the, if people like you and I lived with them, they respected them. If you didn't, you didn't get to live there. They wouldn't let you live there with them. But there was a lot of whites living with the Indians at the time, and they cohabitated beautifully. So there was a lot of camaraderie. But there was still that mentality, you're just an Indian, and you gave it up. You know, Miami's gave it up. Eel River Indians, who cares? Delawares, you know, Hupke. You're done. How many different, uh, different tribes are, you know, like Miami and, um, uh, like I don't, I'm not sure, maybe six, seven in this area. Uh, so. Were they known as peaceful, friendly, or? Yes, you know? absolutely. I don't think, that, Patty, would you, I don't think they were aggressive. They were prompted to be aggressive. They wanted to live very peacefully. Some of the Indian villages were food storage villages. Some were, um, you know, they were just kind of minding their own business. Yeah, they were peaceful. Delaware were peaceful. Sure. Yeah. They didn't want to be bothered. There was nothing wrong. You know, they were just living their lives. So, and then, of course, after that happened, immediately they're wanting to change the Indians to become more white. So, Whites Institute, of course. It becomes a, a school for Indian children. It's wrote about over and over and over. And then Earlham College down in southern Indiana became a sister school to them. So um, what was fascinating was a book um, from a woman called Zit Kalasa. She wrote a book about her time at White's Institute. What's fascinating about her is that she became multicultural, multilingual. She wrote an opera. 
a, a Native American opera that you can still see on YouTube today. They, they redid it. It's beautiful. She played the violin. And then she became an activist for her own tribe, went back west, and became an attorney and spoke for their rights. And she's actually buried in Arlington National Cemetery. That's awesome. It's great. That's, she's she's, a, honor that. she's beautiful. That. Yes. Visually, yes. she's just stunning. If you ever look her up, she's stunning. Because I, I truly believe in dry bones, and God's going to raise up an army. And there's no blood shed that is of innocence that's not going to tell a story. She's one that should be in the history book. Oh, she's one that we should all talk about, and we should all honor and respect for what she was able to do for the multicultural. She did a lot. She did a lot. For, she came back to whites and actually taught as a teacher to the other children for a while. Uh, which was good because I think it, take, it took the edge off those children coming from the western villages into Indiana and being forced to cut their hair and wear white clothing and eat white food and they were scared their parents were not there. No one was there to hug them and, and love them and she was there to help be a buffer. And so they, they quickly learned that if we can get our students to become teachers and help us, we're going to be more successful. So the cemetery is still out there. Most of the children that live there died of a white man's disease, so they're buried there still. You can't go there, so don't ask. Because I can't go there, and if I can't go there, you can't go there. I want to go there. So if you can get me in there, okay. But, um, so yeah, I mean, her white name was Gertrude Bonin. Uh, Zeke Kalasal was her, was her native name. So. Z Z I T K A L A S A. Really? Yeah, really. <laughs> really? <laughs> Try it again, one more time. Z I T okay. K A L A S A. Gertrude Bonin. Gertrude Bonin? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she, she, um, she lived to be. An older woman uh, was very active for, she was the voice of her nation for sure. So. Yeah. That is awesome. Oh, it's, it's a great story. And it's, it really is gut-wrenching because her first excerpts of the book are, I had to cut my hair off. Oh. I'm scared. It's dark. And the name oh. of the book again? Zeke Kalasak. Yeah. Which I believe she was? I believe she was full-blooded blood and soup. Does everybody know about like the French family murders and all that good groovy stuff? Is that anything that's you know? Okay. Do you have any questions? Okay. Was there anything about the KKK and all that? Yeah. So the KKK and I was I was telling Sheila about that earlier. Um, they had a secret meeting house downtown where. Um, what her brother says on the corner. Up above there were movable rooms. The walls could interchange just so they could hide. No and so wow. back in the back corners of that building is where they would have their secret meetings. And of course, the sewing house was in Friends Church on Pike Street. They sewed the gowns and the hoods there. Um, I am not going to take defense from them whatsoever. However, I will say that the KKK in Wabash was viewed not as super aggressive. Even though it was a secret society, if you were in the South, that was a whole different story. Up here, they actually did try to do good, even though the whole mentality of it all we know is really wrong. Uh, they would provide food to people who were starving. They would provide clothing to people who didn't have any. They would just basically leave them on their front porch. They'd wake up and there was the things they needed, you know. So they did do a march down Market Street. The head of the KKK, of the, of the National KKK, actually gave a speech on the courthouse steps. And it did raise a lot of awareness. Probably that reason it happened was because of Elkhart being so, or Elwood being so close to here. That is kind of the capital of Indiana for KKK, I suppose. So that's not that far. And so probably with Wabash being a larger community, it could gather people here faster. That's why it probably happened. So. Did you say the um, KKK uh, had a place that 
the French church on Pike Street? The sewing room was in the basement of the church, so they sewed the gowns and the hoods. Specifically, that, the that church was only be, used for the sewing room. That would be the, the big, like, castle church on Pike Street? Yes, Pike on Pike Street. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. um, the house at 2821 South Old 15, Bill Rouse Old Place. Yes. Now, when Unger lived there, yes. I heard uh -huh. that there was, like, the Underground Railroad tunnels. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. That's wrong. Is it wrong? It's wrong. I've never seen it or anything, right. but... So, uh, it was the Enoch Thomas house. Enoch Thomas was the first builder of the house. That's actually the second house. The first house that was built there is a replica. It burnt down in the first year that he built it. Oh. He was a Quaker for Wabash community. Um, actually, that property was somewhat of a um, summertime campground for the Quakers. He would invite people out for, like, church congregations. It was a beautiful place to have it. So um, the house quickly got rebuilt. In and around 63, 64, well, by then, the war is over. Now, the intention probably was for it to be an underground railroad home, but it's actually off the path. So the path is America Road, coming from Marion, through America Road, up to Manchester, go to Canada, keep going. Okay, so we're really off the path. But slaves did get off the path. Mm -hmm. And that's why we put the candles in, we put the, the quilts out, the, the secret message quilts. That's what was leading them back on the path. The interesting thing about Bill's house, and I call it Rao's house because that's what we know it as mm -hmm. around here, um, right below there mm -hmm. were the cluster of houses by the Treaty Creek. Mm -hmm. That was the Reuben, Reuben Small Mill with Matlock Cemetery up above. Okay, so uh, there was a school there, a mill, lots going on. Um, that was a Quaker community. And so we do have an account of slaves getting off the path and they taking a false bottom wagon. They ended up at the house that's right there on the bend facing the creek. And they put them in the wagon to get them back out onto America Road. They knew at least, the runaway slaves knew at least that area and that community was a safe place. So as far as tunnels being under the house of Bill Rao, there might have been, but it's collapsed. The intent was there, it never got used. Hmm. So I know, we call it the slave house for Wabash County and all the history books it's referred to as a slave house. Hmm. It just, the timing was off. So the intent was there, the timing was off. That's what I said. The first house, maybe, but we don't know enough about that first house because it didn't, it wasn't there long enough. Uh -huh. You know, so that's probably the first house was. But we, the only, the only account we have really is that, and then a runaway slave actually making it into the city of Wabash. The house still stands, and it's a duplex now, and they fed him, laid over, and then got him back out to America Road to keep going. So. That's the only two real accounts I know of the runaway slaves coming and getting lost. So, mm -hmm. yeah. with the, the KKK, uh, uh -huh. the pastor was the leader. Uh huh. And then um, I did read about the fiery cross that they laid on the altar. Yep. Is that like a regular thing or just like one time thing? That I don't know. Okay. Um, but you have to re realize that most of the people under those hoods were all leaders of your community. Your, your bank people, your insurance men, your, your owners of business, those were the, it, it's, I'm disappointed in it really, I really am. For our community, it's something we don't want to praise, but um, that was just the thinking. Yeah. That was the way of thinking. It was just, a, it was something to be a part of. And maybe there was some hateful people in there, I bet there was. You know, but as far as our community goes, they just were followers, you know. I don't think they were leaders in our community. They were, that group was just following the trend, as pitiful as it was. Patty? I did hear from an older person who would probably be about 110 now, because they passed, but they said they were in the KKK, and then they, they thought it was just a club where they'd get yeah. together and do things and do the good things, and then something happened that was not good, and they're like, we're out. And so I right. think they did think in the beginning that it wasn't 
and that was probably happening in the 40s and 50s here when segregation exploded, they were out. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be a part of that. You know, we have, we are, we were more of a diverse melting pot 100 years ago in Wabash than we ever are today. Yeah. We yeah. had Chinese, we had Indians, Irish. Blacks, Mexican, Irish, religiously, Jews were the leading business owners in Wabash County. They were the wealthiest. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We have hardly any. Yeah. You know, and they were gone. So, yeah, uh, you want to talk about diversity in a happening town and electrifying and exciting? Wabash was 100 years ago. Boy, that was something to see. Really. Really. What do you think changed that created less diversity or led mm -hmm. towards? Jobs. I think as the jobs kind of came and went, a lot of our people from Kentucky came here with the General Tire and, and all those those big factories and, and you know, it was good while it lasted. And we lost the industry. We lost the industry. We lost a lot of people. Right. And, and when you're declining. Exactly. So when, you're, when your towns like this lose their industry, then we now have to depend on food, entertainment, which is what we're doing, right? So that's the change. Hopefully that brings back diversity for Wabash. What was the largest population that you guys had? Now. <laughs> I mean, we've never been a booming community. You know, probably that we're at our regular, we're, we're kind of one of these people, we're just steady. Yeah, we've never had 30,000 people. You know, nothing like that. So, and actually our population is still declining as most people's are. <laughs> so, yeah, but I mean, I think we were, uh, because of the trains and the entertainment here, we had vaudeville, we had open air theaters, we had a lot of things going on in Wabash that a lot of other people didn't. They were coming here, but they weren't staying. You know, they were just drifting through, so, you know. Questions? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did you guys know that five hour energy is made here? Yes. Not from yeah. The bar, the drink. Like one of the guys on our team is addicted to those things. <laughs> <laughs> I've never had one. Shame on me. I will never probably. I don't need it. But, uh, I don't want that feeling. So I'm high on life. I guess that's, yeah, yeah, that's, that's all I need. So yeah. It, it made me an odd question. What about Moonrock? Moonrock. So it's out here on the old 24. It's sinking. Moon Rock is a pudding stone. The Indians use it as a praying stone. It was something that was very special to them. Um, it's, a, it's, a type, it's a type of pudding stone that probably came in here during the glacial period, and it just that's where it ended. It's probably the length of this set, first set of chairs, and you only see a quarter of it. It's sinking. Where is it? Um, on it's on private property, oh. so when you're on 24 uh -huh. and you go to the back side where VFW is, yeah. the VFW, it's in that little grove over there. Really? You can't really see it. You cannot see it. It's full of trees, and I think they do that on purpose because it is an attraction. But the interesting thing, I want to say this about put the moon rock, is if you stand on moon rock mm -hmm. and go straight south, you will be at the um, Shanty Hall. Oh, oh, that was directional. Uh -huh. What is the that? The Shanty called? Falls is a waterfall on private property okay. um, out on the old prairie, going out that way, old Pike Street extent, and it is in direct line with the moonstone. Huh. That, cool. that, yeah. cool. That's cool. Yeah. So the people that have moon rock on their property, they don't want anybody coming along? Uh, no. <laughs> I stopped there one day and I didn't stay long. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Huh. Yes, sir. Uh, what's the big factory coming in on 13 there? Is that? That's 5 hour. Is that 5 hour? Oh, yeah. Name on the right. But what did they say? It doesn't say 5 hour. Um, no, living essentials. Oh, living essentials. That's the I thought it was bottled water or something. No. <laughs> okay. Yeah, living essentials. So American Your Water Company, company is out there. Are you thinking the American Water Company? Because they've got a big... Well, it could be that. Yeah. So he's, it's not bottled water there, is it? No. No, no he's thinking you know, he's probably saw water. Yeah. Well, it's a huge mm -hmm. factory. Yeah. Like yeah. building. And like thank goodness they took interest in Wabash. I mean, it's really creative. Okay. A lot of jobs. Okay.
Yeah, that's the industry that we lost. Automotive, it's picked up in food product. So that's the way. That's the way it's going to go for for towns like us. So, uh -huh. um, as far as airplanes, I got on the track of airplanes. We were making airplanes. Uh, the first airport was at the Wabash High School. There was a landing strip there. We were the first to do air mail for Wabash. We're talking about first. Okay. So, so first. Yes. Airmail. Yeah, airmail. Uh, it was coming in there. They were landing and taking off very quickly all the time. So yeah, very cool. I was interested in the French murdering people. Okay. It's going to wear me out. No. <laughs> Where do I start? Uh, so do you know the basic story? I don't know anything. Until we came here, I've never heard of it. Oh, you hadn't heard of it. They you are not from here, are you? <laughs> from Dover. <laughs> Where Teresa's cheese balls are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, we have murder, you have cheese balls. Yeah. So. Um, just real quickly. French family murders happened in Rich Valley, out on the main road. Uh, it was a rude cabin. The French family lived there. Aaron French and his family, children. Um, the Hubbard family, he and his wife came through basically squatted with them, needing a place to live. We're hungry, we're poor, we have nothing. French family took them in. Not very long after that, French family comes up missing. Well, as the weeks go by, they start noticing passerbys that there's a really bad smell coming mm -hmm. from the cabin. Um, when they went to approach the Hubbards, they were wearing the French family's clothing. Okay. Uh, they sold the farm to us for $100, and they went out west. They're gone. They, they moved. Well, they thought that was kind of strange, because they didn't tell their friends, they didn't tell their families they were leaving, they just left, and sold them all everything for $100. Okay. So, um, the constable at the time was, had had enough. He wanted to know. They raped the cabin, lift up the flooring, and there's the French family murders happening all over the floor. All the family from Aaron French, his wife, and the children in order of age are stacked about this tall. Uh. Completely stripped of their clothing and bludgeoned to the head. The murder weapons are in the museum. They're on display. The uh, trial papers are on display. Um, the handcuffs and the turn lock for the cell that had Hubbard is on display. Um, so they hang him, Hubbard, on the uh, courthouse lawn. The only hanging in Wabash County. Really? Only yeah. one. The gallows were stored in the basement of the, of the uh, courthouse for years. Um, and then when the courthouse burnt, they lost the gallow. Um, so because back then dissection of human beings was illegal, they knew that when they took Mr. Hubbard to the pauper's graves out at the Wabash County Farm, they were going to take the body. So they waited. The doctors in town all came to an agreement, we're going to go snatch the body. So they wait to put him in the pauper's grave, off they go. It starts raining that night. Well, when you're in a wagon, two things are bad. Yeah. What would it be? Mud <laughs> and more mud. So, you're yeah, you're going to get stuck. So the race is on. They get word that the Huntington County doctors are also coming to steal the body. So now it's, it's a race. So they get out there and they shoot, the, uh, shoot away the, the doctors from Huntington County. They get the body, throw him in the back. He falls out of the wagon. <laughs> they lift him up, put him back in. They drive him to town. They go down to Canal Street. There's a building downtown on the other side of the canal. Well, they can't just be toting a body around, right? So they wrap him up in a blanket and dunk him into the canal and wait <laughs> till it's clear and then hoist him up the backside of this building and put him in this operation room that they made, a makeshift wow. operation room. They all take a piece of him. Oh. They all take a piece of him. Subsequently enough, I went to Southwood High School here in Wabash County. The bones all make it out to the science lab at Southwood High School. And for years, Mr. Hubbard was on display, not knowing oh that's who it really was. Oh, wow. Yes. And so now the bones 
are disassembled in a box in the basement of the museum. You won't put Mr. Hubbard together? I put him together one time. And you call him some little dry bones to dry be. Bones. Yeah, that's <laughs> real dry bones. He's in a box. I mean, yes. the thing is, I don't really feel we need to glorify him. He's right. like, oh, no. he was a murderer. And so he doesn't get any special treatment. He yes. gets an acid free box. Uh -huh. But you guys, when I was holding his head, I, I, all I could think of was, he, you devil. Yes, you yes. devil. Took life. It really took a lot out of me. And was, so, that, was it two people that did, did it, or was it just him? So he did it. He did the actual murder. His wife was sent to the Indianapolis Sanatorium. She cried she was pregnant with child and should not be in jail. Never did have a child. Uh, she served her life out in the Indianapolis Sanatorium um, all her days as a model prisoner. Never gave anybody any problems. But she was just doing what he was making her do. Yeah. Even though she was guilty by association, mm -hmm. you know. So um, yeah. So he's he's tucked away, and I did bring him out once for a group of people, and I had him covered with a velvet blanket. <laughs> And I think I really scared a lady because she didn't know what was under there. Uh oh. And I just ripped the cover off and said, here's the murderer himself. And she, she about fell out of her chair. I felt so bad. I thought, well, I thought you guys knew what you were here for. You know, I'm sorry. But it's really cool. You should have captured that moment. I didn't want to glorify that either. And I was like, that was a low point in my life. So. But yes, so, I mean, things like that, you know, it's really cool. There's always a second part to the cool stories, you know. And we'll do a good on time. We're okay. i got a few more minutes. But, um, so, because that was so horrific, we talk about the French family murders a lot. There was almost a duplicate murder in the 1940s that happened here in Wabash. Almost duplicate. Wow. Uh, August Beyond, he uh, had a house on Carroll Street. And he attempted to murder a family in LeGro out in, and there was an apple orchard. They were renting this house from a, a gentleman, and he attempted to do the same thing over apples. Oh my. He was a very fiery Frenchman here in town. He, he owned the land. He was renting the house to this family um, called the Fear family, F-E-A-R. And the only survivor was the daughter, Goldie, and she is she just passed away about 15 years ago, and she never spoke about it. She witnessed her family be killed by August, and uh, he was held to trial, and he killed himself before he had the services. So, wow. And that that and I and the only reason it really brought brought to my attention is because the family that bought the farm came to do research because they were having some problems. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's why I put it. I'm on camera, so um, that uh, that was how it got started for me to find out more about these people. And so I found a living descendant of Goldie and called him. He lived in Lafayette. He goes, Oh yeah, oh yeah, that, we've known about that a long time. I'm like, Well, what was she like? You know, what, why didn't she talk about it? He goes, I don't know. She witnessed, you know, her family being killed yeah. over bushels of apples. It was a it was a misconception about who owned them. So very sad. So and that seems to repeat itself. Like we've had numerous murders over the years happen. About every couple of decades, something horrible like that happens. Thank goodness we haven't had anything for a while. So what year was that? That was around the nineteen forties in Wabash County slash La When was the the French one? Uh, 1854 and 55, it, it, they drug on everything. They, they kept him as a prisoner and the, the trial just went forever. That was something we've never had before back then. So people were, it was a show. You know, people were coming from all over to be, even see him walking from the jail, which was on the courthouse lawn, you know, and then we had a newer one right below it. So they were trying to shuffle him around. And they had to protect him because somebody was going to kill him. If they didn't, you know, they weren't even gone. So that was pretty horrific. You had made like a number of different comments about it. I mean, it just sounds like 
maybe even before that, that it's been a very superstitious very. town. Very. Like, what are some of the other, I always say... Witchcraft. Like, you've talked a lot about ghosts discreetly, but, like, what are some of the other things that... I think because we're, we are such a conductor of energy, we have a lot of Native American spirit in Wabash County. Uh, we've had gypsies come and, and squat here, and I think, you know, they've left their impression. Uh, we've had fortune tellers come through and leave their impressions, hobos, all kinds of people. Um, we had gangsters, yeah. you know, come through Wabash. Yep. Um, so out on the prairie is probably one of the more haunted areas of Wabash. Uh, we call it the Bermuda Triangle of Wabash. <laughs> yeah. um, there's a point to a point to a point, and in those three points, it's high energy. Uh, you'll have ball, ball lightning, which is a conductor of energy. Uh, panther sightings, which is a Native American folklore. I did see a panther one time in my life, and it was real. And he went that way, and I went that way. <laughs> I was out at Pearson's Mill trekking. And I reported it to the DNR, and they did not believe me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, throughout the newspapers of Wabash County, uh, the Wabash Plain Dealer goes back all the way to 1848. We have every newspaper from 1848 to current. In every newspaper edition, there was always and was a reporting of seeing a ghost. Mm. People were referring to a ghostly apparition. Bill Rouse House has trouble. You know, there's a lot of houses in town that have problems, is what I call it. Um, there's only a couple houses that I have never, I won't enter into. There was one I stepped into and walked right back out. So, um, you can feel that energy though. You can feel it, it's very negative. Um, my mother is an intuitive, if you believe that. And I, I guess I have a touch of that myself. And it's passed on down to my daughter. So, uh, we just stay out of places that we shouldn't be. Uh, when I did the TV show, that was a train wreck because they were portraying at least three different stories about Wabash that did not have any connection. And so a lot of the time I'm like, what are you talking about? What? You know, so... Um, you know this crazy thing that happened here. <laughs> like, that didn't happen. Didn't know that. But you're from L.A., so yeah. I guess you can certainly school me on what happened here. So, yeah, it was really interesting. So I won't do that again. I won't do it again. So, um, but yeah, I mean, as far as paranormal activity in Wabash County, we have a high amount of it, a high amount. It's not going away anywhere. So, I mean, as far as um, haunted houses, there are several under, in my opinion, that have a residual problem. Residual, it, it comes up uh, on certain times of the year. Something has happened, uh, a timeline. Yeah. So, people don't complain about it until the time of year happens. So, but why? I don't know. I, I don't know. I think it's the river. I think it's the limestone. I think it's just all that energy coming together is what is why we're a hotbed of it. Have you heard something that you want me to tell you? <laughs> I've learned everything today for the first time. Okay. <laughs> well, well you can your cheese us? ball recipe and we'll be <laughs> Can you tell us what houses or? I can't tell you. Okay. I, I wouldn't disclose it. For most yeah. of them are occupied. Okay. I can tell you a street. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you the address. You know, I've done that before. In the Somewhere past, that way. Yeah, this way. <laughs> is it like? Does it matter like what part of town? No. Like, is there all, all throughout Wabash? Isn't it? See, it really, it seems like Hill Street. <laughs> the east sides of the streets, for some reason, Hill. Uh, Maine, all yeah. the east sides, that's a lot of energy that way, and I think we've got the limestone bluff coming down for um, Paradise Spring, um, a lot of natural that's waterway true. there. Yeah. South side is crawling with it. The house is on south side. Uh, the oldest house in the city is on Pike Street. The oldest house in the city, 1830s, is a rental now. Um, I've never heard a thing about it. 
So it'd be interesting to, I know who owns it, but I, I don't, I've not heard anything about it. Uh, mainly the buildings. I was going to say downtown. Yeah, the downtown areas, definitely. Years ago, the one that they actually saw a lot of things and heard a lot of things going on. That wouldn't surprise me. Um, oh, sure, yeah. But I don't think that changes the, the energy. I wonder about that. No, not at all. I mean, there's a baby buried underneath the Coiba building from the canal days. They just buried it right there with a little headstone. It's still there today. I mean, those energies are still there. You know, people died all the time. The funeral homes were downtown. The everything was downtown. So those souls are still there. You know, just leave them alone. Don't mess with them. I have one quick question. Uh -huh. Any kind of like sexual predator? I don't know what you. How, what you'd call it for children or anything like that. The closest we've ever came to is Larry Hall. Okay. Okay. So, and that was young, impressionable girls. Uh, some were complete. All of them were, com were complete victims. Okay. Um, those were teenage girls, young, young adults. That was his victim profiles. Um, no, I guess not. You know, the, the child abuse, any documentation that we would have of it in Wabash, that's the one that comes to my mind the most. And he got what he deserved. So. Yes, he did. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but that is still unsettled for me uh, because he's still living. Uh, he still denies. Yeah. Um, there's been a book out about it. There's a movie coming out about it soon. Um, oh, really? Yeah. Do that. Yeah, the book is called In With the Devil. Um, a gentleman that wrote the book, I can't recall him now, um, he staged himself purposely to be in the same cell as Larry to try to get a confession out of him, and he came very close. Mm -hmm. Apparently there's more than 44 victims, but yeah, they can only pay one, a, oh, a handful. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Um, exactly. Um, my cousin got away from it. He, we lived on South Side off of uh, Vernon Street when I was little for several years and yeah, he milled around other, other Absolutely. There was a lot of, thankfully, a lot yeah, got yes. away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, the scary thing for, for me, he was a reenactor out in 1812. Oh. They were Civil War reenactors, him and his brother Gary, and they did come to 1812 in the very early years that we had it in the 80s. Oh. Um, and then that, he got busted. Um, his brother, Gary, um, still came around once in a while to the reenactment, but that's fizzled out, thankfully. Yeah. So, but one of the murders actually supposedly happened there in that area. And then we did find a body there three years ago. So, and we were probably all the way around her working, pruning, and didn't even know yeah. she was there. Seems to be a, a hotbed place to dump people. Yeah, I mean it's so remote out there sometimes too. You know, um, so yeah. That as far as any child abductions or abuse, no, no. I mean, thank, thank goodness we're not known for that. We were known for a lot of stuff, but not that. so um, yeah. So as individuals, you know, you got a lot of history and a lot of different jobs or lived at different places. Yep. And, there are a lot of stories, but there's times and places in my life that kind of shaped me. Okay. So, for if you had to summarize all that you told us, what what has really shaped Wabash County? We can say it was the first lit city. Was that mm -hmm. is that a benchmark or a, a stake in the ground that says that shaped the city, or what would how would you define it in maybe one or two events? Transportation, because we. Uh, dabbled in it all, if you think about it. We really have. Trains, planes, automobiles, canal. It's, it's, we, we took on the challenge of being a stopping point for all and everyone. No matter who you were, we took you in. We let you stop here, you know, without very much repercussion of it all. Um, some good came out of it, some really bad came out of it, 
But yeah, I would say the transportation, we had interurban, uh, uh, you know, public transportation, which I think we should still go back to. Um, of course, the first lit city. Um, and probably the, the Native American fact that we were so strong here. Uh, the influence is still here. It's delicate to us. It's delicate to me. Um, and I take that very seriously, and I'm very proud of it. So between the transportation, the, the first lit, the Indian War, I would say that's what's, and then of course the industry. I mean, we weren't afraid to take on industry at all. You know, we had the, the grounds and we had the, we had the room to do it. So we had a lot of first thinkers here. We had people that were philanthropists. Some of their jobs were to beautify Wabash, like Richard Ford. That wasn't, his job was not to really create jobs, it was to beautify Wabash and he did it so wonderfully. I worked for him for 11 years. He was the Mr. Honeywell of my time, and I learned a lot, you know. So um, it was very important to know that kind of person. Uh, and then you had your people um, that, like Honeywell, that did create jobs. I mean, Honeywell had jobs, he made jobs, but he also beautified Wabash. Richard created jobs for four meter box, but he beautified Wabash. You know, that was dear to his heart. So I hope we have another one of those someday. Amen. Come on, yeah, yeah, I've learned that. Yep. Yeah, I think we will. Yes. We've got a couple up and comers. Yeah. We just got to get them by the shirt and, you know, yeah. guide them a little bit. We'll get there. And then as far as past revivals seen in Orange County, I didn't hear what you past said. Past revivals? Revivals? Um, Great. Yeah. Under the tent, wonderful. Probably, you know, honestly, house. the revivals probably happened probably along the same times when the circus came to town because a lot of honoriness came with the circus and so they probably felt the need to amplify your religious roots and don't you forget where you came from. Don't go down there. Don't you go down to the circus. You know, that the, in the summertime, the pinnacle of summer when the, when the circus was coming through and the rowdiness was coming through, that was the time to get the revivals going out. Yeah. Make sure you stay in check. Yeah. Good job, yeah. Good job. Okay. <laughs> so, that yeah, that's that's how I would look at that. Yeah. Uh, as far as a crazy group, we had the largest, the king of the gypsies of the United States actually got married here in Wabash. King of the gypsies. Mm -hmm. On Paradise Spring, there was over 5,000 gypsies. They came here for two days and they left without a trace. Wow, 5,000 mm -hmm. people. Yeah, gypsies. gypsies. Only gypsies were allowed to witness. Uh, it was royal, a lot of jewels, a lot of gifts, a lot of gold, a lot of money was given to the couple. Uh, uh, this was around the late 1940s, early 50s, because there's an account of a high school group, three boys that were in band, and nobody could get anybody to come play music for them, so those three boys volunteered and played music for the wedding. And they said there was a lot of alcohol, a lot of food, a lot of treats, and then poof, they were gone. Wow. A royal wedding of the gypsies. Yep. Okay. That wasn't a revival. Yeah. <laughs> that was a large gathering. It was. And there was a little religion, I'm sure, somehow. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. We have about five minutes. Am I boring you? Oh, I, you know, the, the bad thing is, I, it's all in here. And so, unless you ask and me. You can pull it out. Yeah, right? it's like, yeah. Oh, yeah. bring it out, bring it out. Yeah. Yeah. We might have to do part two here. <laughs> That's fine. Okay. Um, I did, I mean, I, I brought a couple books that I used. Like, Hannah's Town is a good book from he, uh, Bill Wimberly. We worked on this about three years. A lot of pictures, a lot of information. My house is in here a couple times. Um, I love this. Bill's not going to be with us forever. Um, what so, you say Bill's last name was? Wimberly. This is my book, and it's got a lot. It's a coffee table book that I did. Um, it's this is an album that has never been seen. It was made in 1894, and it's in the archives at the museum. And it was taken by one photographer. And the really cool thing about this is the faces in here are the faces 
the first shape wall mesh in the 1830s. They're still alive, and their pictures are in here. So you want to see your influencers. You want to see what the buildings look like, and the houses. It's all in here. So this is, you said it was never published. I published it, yes. but it got... A squashed. No, it got plagiarized. Okay. It is in print. Okay. This is a Indiana Bicentennial Legacy Project that I did. It took me about three and a half years, and it got stolen. I mean, it's not in this book, but it's my book. It is her book. I it remember book. she was working on that book. It is her book. <laughs> it was a lot of work. So it must be a really good book if somebody wanted to steal it. <laughs> 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 That's what I would laugh. But no, that was a good book. Great. We wanted it. Yeah, but thank you. I think Hidden will stay that way. That's right. And you get the credit. Yes, for thank you. And I do do tours on the book. I do talk about the book. I'll go wherever you want me to go and talk about the book. I do a slideshow of it. And it's it's just, I love that book. I love it. But the only way to get that book is through the... No, you can get it through um, online. the Indiana Online. They sell it at, like, the State Museum. Okay. It's sold in lots of museums, you know, because it's an Indiana legacy project. Uh -huh. I did it for free and donated in perpetuity all the money back. Yeah. So I don't make a profit from the book. My book is really cool. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, so there's a lot of really, like this greenback book right here, you can get it at the, most of these books are at the library. This is our, what we call the Bible, it's the 76, and that was really, we hadn't had a, a good history book until Wimberly and myself came out with another book. So 76, these things were dropped off in your mailbox like a, a what do I want to call it, a phone book. Yeah. Everybody got one. Everyone got one. Yeah, everybody got one. So, um, but yeah, there's great books at the library, at the museum, at the local museum, go down there, they got lots of great books, so if you want to just, if you like pictures, that's the ones. Yeah. Yeah. And now that you know kind of my style, if you guys want to have me back, bring me some topics and we'll do it again. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Okay. <laughs> we, can, I mean, we can get more yes, scary if you want to. But, um, <laughs> I don't really know, I didn't know really what you wanted from me, you know, but it seems like you're just, you're okay without anything. <laughs> yeah. And That's I got a lot more subjects. Uh, focus our prayers, um, yeah. uh, maybe the buildings where we need to stop on our, on our prayer. Um, I would pray for the county home. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's going to be a big transition with that yeah. at some point. You're going to lose a lot of valuable history. The, where's the county home? The county home's on Manchester Avenue. It's where the new jail will be. Okay. okay. And there's a lot of, what we can guess is there are about 500 bodies that were buried there, yeah. unmarked, unnamed. That was the Hopper's courthouse. Yes. yes. And uh, if you were a ward of the state, basically that's where you were dumped. You were buried. Yeah. It was a very yeah. sad place to be. It's at White's Institute, was that during the, the Indian farm Institute. Too? It was a farm. farm. It was a working farm. Okay. They were very sustaining. That's right. Uh, but it was also an insane asylum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And no medicine mm -hmm. for people like that. Right. They were tortured. Mm -hmm. A lot of buildings there, they got locked up. Because people didn't know how to deal with it. So that's a very sad place for me to be. Mm -hmm. I go there and I, I give a tour there and it's just, yeah, I could feel it. Mm -hmm. it's sad. And then when you're going through Indian land, my favorite thing to do is go down 124 and go the back way to Peru. Mm -hmm. Boy, you can feel it. <laughs> I can feel it. A lot of Indians. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> yep. So when you go through there, just say a prayer. Yes. For them. They need it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, just everybody. Yeah. Just pray for everybody. Everybody needs prayer no matter how. Good or bad, you are. Yes, yes. We all need it. Yep. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank I appreciate you. it. Well, I think we ought to end this prayer. And kind of that sounds good. good. That's right. Can you leave? You're good. I'm You're good. good. You're good. You got it. You're good. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, does anybody uh, feel a need to pray? Okay. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for being invited into your presence today and being able to learn a little bit about the history of Wabash County. We want to focus our prayers on the things that are mentioned, and, and we ask your Holy Spirit for um, just a, 
enlighten us on other areas within Wabash County that we can focus our prayer, um, that we can ask for forgiveness as intercessors, Father. We as your children, um, we just want to serve you, and we want to pray and bring revival upon Wabash County. And I just thank you for all that you are doing within this county. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Very good.